greater than your pass, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now. I'm going to ask you to take your device, your Bible, whatever you use to access the Word of God, hold it high and repeat after me. Devil, you have no business in this place. This is God's church. We're God's people. This is God's word. So devil, get out of here. Because the spirit of God is about to move. If you believe that, ladies and gentlemen, put those Bibles down now and put your hands together for Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus tonight, we come in spite of our broken yesterdays and our troubled todays with deep anticipation for bright tomorrows. You indicated, O oh Lord, that our ladder can be greater and will be greater than our pasts, but only as we walk with you. So now, Lord, we come claiming the promises of Jeremiah 29, 11. The thoughts you have for us are thoughts of peace and not of evil with bright and hopeful futures. Let it be, I pray, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you love Jesus, put your hands together one more time. And I invite you to be seated now in the presence of the Lord. And I'm going to ask my young people here. I love having you here. Listen to me, every one of you. I want to take care of you tonight. We have special, special snacks for you tonight. They're extraordinarily special. But you know what? I'm not going to be able to give them to you unless you're real quiet. You know what I'm saying? You got me? You know I love you, right? Okay, so you all have to be real, real quiet. Now, um, I'm told that there are some blockages outside of cars. Uh, we do have a full crowd here tonight. And I'm wondering, uh, there's a white Ford Fusion with a license plate. 87A PNN. That's a white Ford Fusion. I guess you, not, you need to reposition your car. And then there is, well, someone evidently cannot spell. Uh, I don't know what this is. Um, what about a Kia Optima? A Kia Optima. Oh, it says that's black. That's what that says, black. Okay, black Kia Optima uh, Y216B8. Okay, so you want to try to reposition your cars, put them in a spot where it's okay, where they won't be in any way tampered with. Uh, we want you to be safe. Now, I, I did notice another certificate here. We had Benji here already, but I think there was another one. Is LaToya Davis in the house tonight? LaToya Davis? Is, well, you take it to her since you know where she is. All right, there we are. Okay. Thank you, LaToya. Oh, God bless you. You're not LaToya. Is that LaToya? You sure? All righty. Okay, I thought that little baby was a toy. I was getting nervous. I said, man, that's some good stuff there, but it's also some scary stuff. My subject tonight is RSVP, a new life experience. Have you ever needed a little extra cash money? Anybody here? Talk to me on here. Do you need a little cash money? Have you ever wondered about a job that would quickly bring you in the extra cash that you needed? You know, there was an American Christian college student, have a seat, sweetheart, who was running short on money to pay for his college entrance fees, as well as his books and his tuition. He knew that he would have to look for the best possible paying summer job to be back in college the very next year. So randomly, Searching through the newspaper one day, he saw an advertisement from a company hiring college students to cut lumber deep in the forests of Canada. At first, he was hesitant. He knew these lumberjacks were a pretty rough bunch. Get some air swirling in here, whoever controls the air and the temperature. We need it cool. Make it cold in here because we, you know, it's too muggy. We can be healthy if it's cold. At first, he was hesitant. And he knew that these lumberjacks were a pretty rough bunch. So as a Christian, how could he survive for three months in the summer at a lumber camp with these alcohol-drinking, smoking, cursing men, but he needed the money? 
So he applied for the position. And all summer, he worked with these non-Christian men cutting trees and hauling lumber. And at the end of the summer, somebody fix this air, make sure it swirls. Move quickly, please. At the end of the summer, he received quite a sizable paycheck. When he arrived back at school and shared with his friends his summer activities, one of them asked him, as a Christian, my man, how did you ever survive with these rough guys all summer? They went on to say they were drinking and smoking and carousing in town and cussing everybody out every day. The young man responded, it was quite simple. I determined they would never find out I was a Christian. You know, ladies and gentlemen, fix this air, please, somebody. Where's the pastor? Fix the air in the back, okay? In the last days of Earth's history, neutrality, I need you to know, neutrality will not do. God is calling every one of us to take a public stand. Are you with me? I share with you every night. Either we're going to be directed by God or driven by the devil. Either we're going to be influenced by Jesus or infested by the devil. Either we're going to be sanctified by a Holy Spirit or desecrated by an evil spirit. There is no middle ground of neutrality. There is no straddling the fence when it comes to spiritual things. We will not be able to sit on the fence. The entire world will be called to openly, publicly declare whose side they're on. You know, the truths of God's word give us something to stand on. That's why our theme for these meetings have been clear, has been clear and succinct. Repeat after me, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. You know, the book of Revelation reveals a God of incredible love who never forces our allegiance or coerces our will. Throughout the Bible, the book of Revelation, he invites us to come to him freely. He says, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. In Revelation, Jesus is pictured as the lamb who dies to gain our ultimate freedom. God is calling out a people to be faithful to him. As a matter of fact, he's calling them to lovingly keep his commandments, and he invites them to publicly declare, hear me tonight, to publicly declare their loyalty, to declare their allegiance to him. How do we take a stand? Revelation points us in the right direction. Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says it this way. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Let me ask you, does God have a visible symbol that we are washed in the blood of Christ? He does. And baptism is a symbol of our commitment, loyalty, and allegiance to Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus instructed his disciples with these words, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go, therefore, I'm reading the Bible. You see, I put these Bible texts up on the screen every night because I want you to read them. Don't just trust a preacher because he has on a white shirt and a dark suit and, and, and a microphone in his hand talking loud. Don't believe him if he can't prove from thus saith the Lord. I put these Bible texts up on the screen because I want you to check them out for yourself. The Bible says, go, therefore... And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. When we are baptized, and I'm so happy this weekend, guess what? We have a big, big culmination of what's been going on for the past week and a half, for the past almost two weeks now. On this coming Saturday morning, we're having at 11.30 a.m., we're having a big pain-burying ceremony. And do you realize already scores of people have signed up for that? 
What happens when we are baptized? What happens when we bury our pain? We declare our allegiance. We take a public stand. We show whose side we are on. Yet many Christians are confused. Listen to me tonight. Many Christians are confused over this basic Bible ordinance. How many kinds of baptism are there? You know, some churches sprinkle babies. Others pour water over the head of a baby or a young child. One denomination, and you know, I don't preach denominationalism out here. I'm preaching the Bible. One denomination practices olive oil baptism. I even read of a church that sprinkled rose petals over the head of its youth, declaring that they were baptized. I also noticed that one pastor took his youth out into the mountains and so-called baptized them by letting them lay in the snow and covering them with it. When he was questioned about this modality, he says, it doesn't make any difference whether the water is liquid or solid. Was this pastor right? You know, the Bible declares that there is only one true method of baptism. I love teaching the Bible. I don't like just standing up giving my opinion. I love teaching the Bible. It clearly says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Say it with me, everybody. Come on. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay, you know what that's saying? That's saying it's one biblical method. Wouldn't you agree with me tonight that the best way to discover the true method of baptism is to discover how Jesus was baptized? If we're baptized the same way Jesus was, we certainly cannot go wrong. You know, in Mark chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible teaches it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 goes on to say, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. I want to say, according to Holy Writ, when Jesus was baptized, he went down into the water, and he came up out of the water. In other words, he was immersed. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly, a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I need you to understand, Jesus' baptism by full immersion was significant as an event in his life. And your baptism will be a significant event in your life. Now, there were two special things that happened to Jesus at his baptism. First, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus to give him supernatural spiritual power to face the temptations of the evil one. The Bible promises that when we are baptized, we too will receive that same spiritual power. I don't know about you folk, but wouldn't you like to have some of that spiritual power that Jesus had? It came upon Jesus, and it, was also, it will also come upon us. He received power at his baptism, and as we by faith open our hearts to him, we will receive the Holy Spirit at our baptism. The scripture says, Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. The second thing, listen carefully as I teach tonight. The second thing that happened at Jesus' baptism was the Father spoke to him from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, according to Matthew 3, 17. Let me tell you something, folks. Every time a child of God responds to the call of Christ and is baptized, taking a public stand for our Lord, heaven is pleased. When you're baptized, once again, the Father will say, This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. You know, believers down through the centuries have experienced the joy of making a full commitment to Christ through baptism. Sometimes they've been the only members of their family to do so. 
As a matter of fact, I like to see couples moving together. I like to see parents and children moving together. What an example of solidarity. You've got support for one another when you take that beautiful step. Sometimes they've been the only members of their city or village or city to do so. You know, God, ladies and gentlemen, always calls us singly and alone. He certainly did that one day with an Ethiopian returning from Jerusalem. As the Ethiopian read scripture, God miraculously led Philip to him. Philip explained the word of God to this prominent Ethiopian. He answered his questions and made a strong appeal for this man to fully, completely dedicate his life to Christ. The Ethiopian responded, thrilled with his new relationship with Jesus. He longed to be baptized. As a matter of fact, his request is found in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 39. The Bible says, now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So he commanded, Philip commanded, that the chariot stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. Now, when they came up out of the water, let's pause here for just a moment. Now, these verses teach us some vital truths about baptism. The Ethiopian was baptized, listen to me tonight, when he openly accepted Christ. His baptism was a public decision that he was taking a stand. Both Philip and the Ethiopian went down into the water. The Ethiopian was fully immersed. Philip lowered the Ethiopian gently below the crystal clear water as a symbol of Christ's ability to cleanse the entire person from sin. Are you listening to me tonight? The whole person must be immersed because the whole person has sinned. I need you to know that every part of us must go under the water because every part of us has sinned. You know, we need a lot more than sprinkling tonight. We need to be cleansed totally. We need Bible baptism. We need full immersion. In fact, you may not be aware of the meaning of the word baptism. Baptism, what does it mean? You know, the Greek word baptize means to dip, to immerse, to plunge underwater. If a Greek woman desired to completely change the color of a piece of cloth, she would plunge it underwater. The Greek word for that action was baptizo. Stop talking. Baptism by immersion was certainly the practice of the ancient churches. As a matter of fact, archaeology reveals baptismal sites in these churches in the early centuries. Ancient churches reveal the method of baptism used as well. Now, here's, here's an ancient Christian church site with a baptistry near Ephesus. That's Turkey. I visited Turkey just three years ago. The size of the pool-like structure, according to archaeologists and historians, demonstrate the fact that in those days, only adults were baptized by immersion. Now, this is an early Christian church in Philippi. In the remains of the church, we see an early baptistry where the New Testament Christians baptized believers by immersion. St. John of Lateran is the second largest church in Rome. It's the most famous church in Rome after St. Peter's Cathedral. And if you walk through the narrow alleyway to the back of the church, you discover something quite remarkable, a beautiful baptistry. Our Roman Catholic friends practiced baptism by immersion as late as the, as the 13th century. Now, the baptistries in these ancient churches clearly reveal that the church practiced Bible baptism by immersion for hundreds of years. Now, here's the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I'm sure you've heard of that before. You might be familiar with the bell tower, which is world famous because of the angle at which it is leaning. You may not be as familiar with the baptistry behind the tower, where our Roman Catholic friends practiced 
baptism by immersion for centuries. One of the most remarkable baptistries in the world is found in Cappadocia. That's a city of refuge deep within the caves of southeast Turkey. I was there where Christians found refuge from their oppressors in the Middle Ages. Let's enter in now through the carved rock into their secret city of refuge and place of worship. Here carved in rock, ladies and gentlemen, is the baptistry where these faithful Christians baptized by full immersion. What am I trying to teach tonight? Immersion was the practice of the New Testament church. Jesus was baptized by immersion. The disciples baptized believers by immersion. The early church baptized by immersion. And believers through the centuries have followed this biblical practice. It was not until the Council of Ravenna in AD 1311 that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. The church introduced sprinkling, watch this, as a more convenient method of baptism. Many people, in other words, put off their baptism until they were near death. It was very difficult then for them to be immersed. So gradually, after many years, sprinkling was accepted as equally valid as immersion. Now, during this, this System for Survival Community Initiative, as I've taught from the Bible night after night, we've seen many practices, listen carefully, we've seen many practices that have slipped into the Christian church which have no foundation in Scripture. For example, Sunday worship, the concept of the immortal soul, and sprinkling have no basis in the Bible whatsoever. God is calling us back, back to the Bible and back to the true biblical method of baptism. What is the meaning of Bible baptism? Romans 6, 3, and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Ladies and gentlemen, when you go into that water, and some of you are going to have the opportunity to do that this coming weekend. I'm so excited. So many members of our community have called and have indicated their desire to sign up for the pain burying sermon. There's a whole lot of pain in our community. And when you go into that water, we're going to see it right on the screen. You're going to remain right in your seats, and you're going to see the community as they take their families and their young people and their spouses, and they go into that water. When you go into that water, it is saying, Lord, I accept your death on the cross for me. It's saying, I want my all of my pain, and I want my old way of life to be buried, and I want to live a happier life in Christ. What does baptism represent? Baptism represents, number one, dying to old sinful ways of life. What am I talking about? Is there something you did a year ago, five years ago, or ten years ago, something that haunts you tonight, something that troubles your soul tonight? Let me tell you something. When you walk into those waters of baptism, you are dying to all of those mistakes you made in the past. All the pain that torments you and troubles you today. You're burying that stuff and you're leaving it in that water. You're dying to that guilt of the past. You're dying to that condemnation of the past. Everything in the past is cleansed. Secondly, you're burying your sins. Listen now, listen. You're burying your sins and you're burying your pain. You're burying your problems. You're burying your difficulties in the watery grave. But somebody says, wait a minute, Ron. Doesn't God forgive me every time I confess my sin? Why do I have to go through all this? Sure he does. But look, have you remembered every sin you ever committed in your past life? When you walk into the watery grave of baptism, it is saying, God, I give my whole self to you. All the sins I remember and all the ones I don't. Lord, take my whole life. Take my pain. 
take my concerns and just count my whole past, life, sin, and guilt. I'm going to go under the water and everything is going to be cleansed and buried whether I ever confessed it or I didn't. And I'm going to come up a new man or a new woman in Christ. I'm going to start a new slate. I'm going to begin my life again with you. Thirdly, rising up again out of the water to walk in the newness of life is also what baptism means. You know, it's one thing I want to say to you. It's one thing to have a new car. I love cars. A new suit. I love clothes. A new dress. I love to see ladies wearing pretty dresses and suits and outfits. A new pair of shoes. I like to look at shoes, but I'll tell you something. The most exciting thing in life is a new life. You can walk through the water and the old life will be gone forever. You'll have a clean slate before the judgment bar in heaven. You can rise up out of that water to walk in a new life. Now, this is the symbol of the resurrection coming up out of the water. I taught that the other night. The Bible says, watch this. Some people say, I keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection. The Bible says that Sunday keeping is not the symbol of the resurrection. Baptism is. The burial and the coming alive. You come up out of the water with the spirit filling your life to live a new life in Christ. You come up out of that water smiling, happy, optimistic, looking to the future, rejoicing in Jesus Christ. Baptism does not mean you're perfect. It means you're committed. Somebody says, should I wait until I'm perfect to get baptized? No. If you do, you will never move ahead in Bible baptism. Baptism does not mean you are perfect. A lot of people have that hang up. I ain't ready yet. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you're committed. Baptism is not the end of the Christian life. It's the beginning. It's a definite decision to walk through that water. Baptism gives us a new sense of direction. We say, God, I'm yours. Baptism gives us a new sense of freedom. I am Christ's. Baptism gives us a new spiritual power in our lives. What happens when we are baptized? I'll tell you what happens. Number one, I like this part. Every sin is forgiven. Acts 2.28, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. How many should be baptized? Talk to me, somebody. How many should be baptized? Everyone. Somebody says, wait a minute, Ron. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're getting happy and you're talking very dogmatic up there. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're saying, what about the thief on the cross? You're telling me right now, he was never baptized. I read that story very carefully. Lord, please remember me when you get into your kingdom. Where would the thief have gone if he had come off the cross? Where? He would have gone to be baptized. So the Bible says baptism is for everyone, not just a select few. At baptism, what I love is the fact that every sin is forgiven. At baptism, the Holy Spirit empowers us. The Spirit is given to us, according to Mark 1.10. Mark 1.10 says, And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending like a dove. Oh, I like that part. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh, some of you wonder, how in the world can I be good? How can I stop sinning? How in the world am I going to keep God's law? You can't do that. You don't have the ability to do that. But Christ inside of you is the hope of glory. God says, I've got a gift for you. When you're baptized, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. For the promise is to you and to your children. I love to see parents and children 
getting into that water together. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. When God calls you to baptism and you are cleansed, he promises you the gift of the Spirit to empower your life. What's the third thing that happens at baptism? We are adopted into God's family. Nothing is more sad to me when people call me to a funeral home to try to conduct a eulogy and to bury their loved one and one or two or three people are there for their precious loved one. Nothing is more sad when people have no family and they have no friends and they have no church community. That thing is sad. But you know what happens when you're, when you're baptized? You are adopted into God's family. We become a part of the body of believers. Acts 2.41, then those who gladly received this word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Ladies and gentlemen, when you are baptized, you gladly receive God's word. Well, let me ask you. Have you been gladly receiving God's word as I've been sharing it from night to night? Have you been learning some new stuff? Talk to me, anybody. Have you been learning some new stuff? How many of you have learned something from these lectures from night to night? Just say amen if you have. You've been learning God's plan for your life. You've been discovering new strategies for comporting your family and how to hold on to your house and how to, how to pay your bills. You've been discovering some new truths from God's word. It's now time to make a decision. The Spirit of God has been speaking to your heart. It's now time to follow his truth. You know, many people wonder how baptism relates to church membership. Did people who were baptized also join the church? Watch Acts 2.42. The Bible says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Acts 2.47. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Ladies and gentlemen, when you're baptized, you become a part of the church of God. Bible-believing, commandment-keeping people, just like it says here, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. You want a church that's a Bible-believing church, don't you? You want a church that follows in harmonies with the teachings of God's word, don't you? Well, then you need to follow a church that teaches not nine, not eight, but all ten of God's commandments. When you're baptized, your sins are forgiven. When you're baptized, your life is cleansed. When you're baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized, you become part of a worldwide Sabbath-keeping fellowship all around the world. I need you to understand it's an international community of faith. God is leading people of all nationalities, language, and religious persuasions and denominations to his last day movement tonight, and he's gathering them into one final worldwide Sabbath-keeping community. He's leading men and women tonight in some very unusual ways. Somebody asks me right now, since so many have signed up for the pain-burying ceremony this weekend, what steps should a person take before being baptized. Number one, repent. You know what repentance is? A genuine sorrow for sin. Have you come to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe that you alone can forgive my sins. I can't forgive my own sins. Nobody on earth can forgive my sins. You can. I believe that you alone are my savior. I believe you alone can give me your power to be a new man or a new woman. If you have, if you've done that, or if you're willing to do that, you've taken the first step on this journey of faith. Repentance is being sorry enough for my sins that I'm willing to stop. Repentance means my attitude toward my sins has changed. What's the second thing that happened? Believe. You know what that is? Steps to baptism. Believe. Number two. That's an acceptance of Jesus as both Savior and Lord. What am I trying to say? If you've repented of your sin, if you believe that Christ is your Savior and your Lord, and thirdly, learn 
That's what I'm trying to do here. I'm not here to preach for money. You know that, right? I've got a job. I'm not trying to preach me out of church. I'm not taking any offerings from here to put in my pocket to buy me stuff. I've brought thousands of dollars to this community just for this rally. I'm not here for anything except the fact that I love God's people. I love this Gainesville community. So I'm here to teach so that we can learn. Learning is instruction in the essentials of biblical faith. We're going to be growing and learning all of our lives, aren't we? Aren't we? Aren't we going to be learning and growing all of our lives? But if you understand the basics of the biblical faith, the essential truths of God's word, he invites you. You don't have to know everything. You're going to learn that over time. He invites you to make that decision to be baptized. Now, during this series of meetings, have you learned some new truths from God's word? Have you? Well, it's time to commit to follow Jesus all the way. Get your family healed. Get your family whole. Get your family on the right track. Somebody asks, what if you've already been baptized? What if you're baptized already? You know, there's an instance in the Bible when people, watch this, were rebaptized. Here it is. The apostle Paul was preaching in the upper coast of Ephesus, and a group of people, a group of people came to him, Acts 19, 2 through 5. He said to them, Watch this, listen carefully. He says to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We've not so much as heard whether there's a Holy Spirit. Paul instructed them more fully. And though they had once been baptized by immersion already, Paul rebaptized them by immersion. They wanted to walk, listen to me, in all the light of God's word. Now, there are two reasons to reconsider about rebaptism. An individual may desire to be rebaptized. Watch that screen. If, watch this, they once were baptized and departed from Christ, but now they long to return. Now, you see, folk, you don't get rebaptized every time you sin because if you did, you'd be getting baptized in your bathtub almost every hour. But if you turn your back on Christ, baptism by immersion is a symbol of death to the old way of life. It's a symbol that, that, that the burial of the old way of life and resurrection to the new way of life is evolving. If, watch this, let me say it another way. If I walk away from the new way of life, if I disavow the things I once believed, if I turn my back on those teachings and truths and on Christ, I come to a series of meetings like this, and God stirs my heart, and God moves in my heart, and I say, I want to accept. I want to come all the way back. I've slipped away. I've backslidden. I've drifted away. It's time to get serious about the Lord. Come back to Christ and be rebaptized. Secondly, there's another reason people may desire rebaptism. They are committed Christians who have discovered the truth of God's word, and they desire to be a part of his commandment-keeping people. You know, they are lovely Christians, folks. Watch this. They love Jesus so much. They, 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 just, they just love him with all of their heart, and they come to a meeting like this, and they're like John's disciples. They had some of the truth, but they've learned more. You know, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. There are some that's been keeping eight or nine of God's commandments, but not all ten. You too may desire to be rebaptized. It's a choice you may want to make. Hear me clearly tonight. If you are a committed Christian and you've discovered the truth of God's word and you say, look, I want to have the errors of the past washed away. I want to be a part of God's commandment-keeping people. If this is your desire, li listen to me. There is biblical precedent for being rebaptized. The Bible doesn't say that you must do that. But if God stirs you, I will not forbid you. We would say, come into the baptismal pool with your family. 
Come with your community residents. Come with your friends. God is calling you. And if you're like John's disciples had part of the truth, but now see more light of truth, move forward. If you're a Christian, by going into the water, I need you to hear me what I'm saying right now. If you are already a Christian, by going into the water, you are not denying your Christian experience. We're not saying you aren't a Christian. You know, the Lord says, sheep I have, another fold. God has people in every faith tradition, every denomination, worshiping on very days. Are you listening to me? But when his sheep hear his voice, they follow. When John's disciples were baptized, they did not deny the fact that they were already Christians. They did not deny their previous experience. They said, we learn a larger body of truth, and we want to move ahead. We want the further truth that God has. If that's your desire, I encourage you to make the decision to follow Christ. Somebody asks, how important is baptism? Nicodemus came seeking Jesus at night. You know, I used to watch TV. They used to say, Nick at night. We ain't talking about that Nick at night. We're talking about Nicodemus at night seeking Jesus. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's not me. That's the Bible. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, there is no need for you to wait. Some say, well, I want to wait until I'm ready. What are you talking about when you're ready? There's never a more seasonable hour than the earliest time. Hope you're listening to me, folk. There's never a more favorable time to get baptized than the soonest time that you can. Now is the day to seal it in your heart. Now is the day to say, Lord, I want my sins forgiven. I want to be cleansed. Tomorrow is not promised. The day after tomorrow is not promised. Next week is not promised. Now is the day to say, I want to look forward to baptism and have the Holy Spirit fill my life. Now is the time that I want to join men and women around the world that are keeping God's commandments. God is working miracles around the world tonight. His Holy Spirit is being poured out in the Philippines. Thousands are coming to Christ and are being baptized. God is really on the move. The gospel is going to the world. Come with me to Africa. A spiritual revival is taking place in most countries of Africa. God is doing something unusual again. Thousands are being baptized into Jesus Christ. Prophecy is being fulfilled. God is on the move. In the former communist lands, God is working miracles. The Berlin Wall has crumbled. The Iron Curtain has come down. Totalitarian regimes are no more. And Romania, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Poland, Russia, God is doing something amazing. The gospel is going forward in power, and tens of thousands are responding to God's final call. Prophecy is being fulfilled. God is on the move. What about the Hindu lands? Come with me to India. Here is a country that has resisted the preaching of the gospel. Early Christian missionaries worked for decades for just one convert. But India is open to the gospel tonight. Thousands are coming to Christ that are being baptized. Former Hindus are becoming Christians. In one section of northern India, over 100,000 have recently accepted Jesus Christ. In every village, people are begging for someone to tell them about Jesus. Prophecy is being fulfilled. God is on the move. Even in the United States, in the, in the land of prosperity and plenty, God is on the move. Come, if you can, just for a moment with me, and watch as these young people that I baptize, I had a joy baptizing them, they're giving their hearts to Jesus Christ. 
even in rich, prosperous America, God is still on the move. Jesus said, except you be converted and become as little children. You shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Come with me now to Florida City and watch as some older people and whole families are coming from all over to surrender their hearts to Jesus Christ. Prophecy is being fulfilled in Georgia. God is on the move. Acts 22 asks, and now what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. All of heaven is waiting for you to take that stand for Christ. All of heaven is waiting for you. You know, Pastor Dwayne was traveling to the village in, in Kokoloka. That's what it's called. That's a unique name in Kokoloka, a little section of Africa, Central Africa to be exact. He was there for a baptism. And in that city, he met several people who had prepared to be baptized. In fact, they had waited almost a year for the pastor to come through to baptize them. So the pastor told them the next day that he would be there for baptism. The next day, when the pastor returned, after having a large baptism in another area, some of the people planning to be baptized were at a village in the forest, cutting trees. They thought that it was the following day that the pastor was going to be there for baptism. The pastor went ahead. He said the candidates were there. They were examined. They were baptized. The hour was very late, and after baptizing people all day, the pastor had to go on to a distant village that night. And as the pastor finished baptizing the last person, several ladies came out of the forest where they were working, and when they saw what was happening, they said, oh, we misunderstood. We want to be baptized too. We didn't know what was going on right now. The pastor had a schedule to keep. He says, I'm sorry, I got to go. So he went on to the next town. The next time we're here, he says, we'll have another baptism. Well, Bertha and her friend, they felt horrible. And as the pastor drove away in the Land Rover, she and her friend, they began to walk because they knew that in the forest, a large tree had fallen across the road the day before, and they thought that when the pastor came to that tree, he would turn around and come back and see them walking and stop and baptize them. But the pastor didn't have to stop because someone had cut the tree that day with a machete and had moved it aside, so the pastor just kept on driving. And when Bertha and her friend got to that spot and saw the tree had been moved, they were devastated, but not deterred. They kept walking. They walked over 18 miles, 30 kilometers that long night. The next morning at sunrise, they arrived at the village where the pastor was sleeping and knocked on his door. The pastor was amazed to see Bertha and her friend who explained that they had walked all night long so that they could be baptized. The pastor says, you got to tell me, ladies, why in the world would you walk all night long to be baptized? And Bertha responded with the words that the pastor will never forget. Pastor, I'm so sick and tired of this old world. Aren't you tired? of street fights and vandalisms and stinking trash and lottery playing and subpar educational systems and insincere preachers and makeshift teachers and dysfunctional marriages and foreclosed houses and repossessed cars and unhappy singlehood and fear. Aren't you tired of dog eat dog survival tactics and unhealthy competition and neuroses and psychoses and bar shootings and high school shootings and theater shootings and frivolity and marijuana and crack and crowded freeways and gangster rap hits and drive-by killings and heroin and night stalking and rats and roaches and fear. Aren't you tired of empty senatorial races and shacking up and orgies and crypt deaths and murders and child custody issues and alimony and extortion and swindling and faulty traffic lights and female street walkers and pimps 
and venereal disease and AIDS and diabetes and cancers and depression and schizophrenia. Aren't you tired of destructive partying and expensive nightclubs and packed prisons and crowded courts and serial rapings and noisy airports and foul-smelling train stations and drunken stupors and unauthorized sneaky sex and ostentatious bragging and horoscope and molestations and entrepreneurial street drug sales and senior citizen abuse and fist fighting and fear. Aren't you tired? of urban ghettos and rip-off artists and child abductions and gang rivalries of Crips and Bloods and Snooping Dogs and Bow Wows and T.I.s and Lil Wayne's and Puffed Up Daddies and Urban War Zones and Video Hip Hop and R&B Dancers and Picket Lines and Spouse Swapping and Neglected Inner City Neighborhoods and Triple X Rated Movies and Uzis and 357 Magnums and Poverty Stricken People and public assistance and government cheese and financial strangleholds and chapter sevens and chapter thirteens and disproportionate wealth and promiscuity and so much feuding and fussing and cussing in the middle of the night is clear to me that what I need, I don't need a new township of Gainesville. I don't need a new church. I don't need a new house. I don't need a new car. I don't need a new city. What I need is the holy city. Our God must come. Our God will come. He will not keep silent. He's been silent for 6,000 years. But when he comes back the second time, he's coming back with a shout. And the world's going to be under new management. My prayer is that the earliest time, you will embrace the true pillar of life. And that is Jesus Christ, none other. I need to tell you something. You know, when I made a decision to be baptized, when my family went in the water, I remember we were struggling. We were poor, living in the hood of Brooklyn, New York. Parents drinking and smoking. But we found a lady who knocked on our door invited us to a series of meetings just like this. Everything changed. Came out of the ghetto. Oh, I'm testifying now. I'm not bragging. God has given me two doctorates. A business. A life. Influence. Everything has changed. Health has changed. Lord has healed me of a stroke where the doctor said I would never walk again. The Lord has healed me of cancer. Don't tell me God is not a healer. Let me tell you, folks, it pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day. It pays every step of the way. My prayer for you is, at the earliest time, you will make that full surrender to Jesus Christ. But tonight, we're broken, we're battered, we're wounded, we're hurting. Things aren't going very well for us. That's why I'm here. That's why we're here. Because we need Jesus. I need you to know, when you mess up, he's a robe to cover your shame. When you need a doctor, he's the best one you could ever find. He's the best friend you could ever find. When you need a job, he's the best employment agent in the universe. Oh, yes, there's blight. There are problems. There are difficulties. Yes, some of us are battling with health issues today. The blood work has come back revelatory of a challenge. But God is a healer. Some of us are battling finances tonight. We need stuff. Some people need a roof over their heads. Some people need transportation. Some people need an overhaul of their business. Somebody needs a career change tonight. Somebody needs tuition money tonight. Well, there's a relationship challenge in here. 
you know, brokenness in our relationships. Sometimes they're in our families, mother to daughter, father to son, husband to wife, boyfriend to girlfriend. In the workplace, in the home, in the market square, in the church. God says, I can heal. I can bring restoration to your relationships. But then there are also strongholds. You know, some of us have monkeys on our backs. I'm talking about intergenerational curses. The God I serve, listen to me, can break every chain. And tonight, I challenge you to follow Jesus. Oh, I love him tonight. Do you love him tonight? I want to pray for families tonight before they go home. I don't want you to carry the same stuff. I want you to pray for those people who have already made a decision to bury their pain this coming weekend. And I'm praying for you if there's a need as well. But tonight, if you love him, just stand to your feet. If you love Jesus, just stand to your feet. Because I want to pray for you. And Kimberly's going to sing a song now. And as she sings that song, I invite you to come forward and get the power yeah. that God has for you yeah. to fix your life. Sing it, Kimberly. I, I see you come. I will follow Just come on in. Thee, my Savior. We're going to make room for those people behind us. Just step yes, on in. So my lot may be and where thou go I will follow. Yes, my Lord. And yes, my Lord. I'll follow thee. I'll follow thee. And I will follow thee, my Savior. Savior, the chorus one more time. And I will follow thee, my Savior. again with a quest to follow you. We want to follow you, but Lord, there are things going on in our lives right now. There's a lot of pain. There are some bodies that are sick tonight. Somebody came to this altar. Someone came to the community healing service praying for their child. Oh God, I pray that you will stretch your hand as a healer and heal that child, wherever the child is. There's somebody who's come to this altar, O oh Lord, because there's something going on in their body that needs to be fixed. Oh God, I pray that you might exercise yourself tonight as a healer. And then, Lord, there are some financial woes that are at this altar as well. Lord, you know the needs. You understand what needs to happen. Somebody needs a roof over their head. Somebody needs transportation. Somebody needs a job. Somebody needs money. Oh, God, we're not reckless in our requests tonight. But you know all about us. You understand the suffering. You understand the struggle. And tonight, oh, God, I pray that you would open up 
the windows of heaven and rain down manna if necessary. Touch the financial situation of everybody who needs tonight. And then, Lord, there are some relationship challenges here as well. Lord, help us to say we're sorry. Give us Olive Branch ministry to try again. Help us to restore communication and reestablish intimacy. Help us to say we're sorry. Can we try again? Rebuild relationships. And then, Lord, there are some strongholds tonight. There are some people who are having some hard times with, 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 with things that have just passed from mama and grandmama and to great-grandmama down to me. Oh, God, intergenerational stuff. Relationships that are unauthorized by you causing us pain. Addictions to substances, to alcohol. Oh, God, tonight I pray that you will set us free. You said, if the Son, therefore, shall make us free, we shall be free indeed. Oh, God, I pray that you will break every chain. So, Lord, I'm praying tonight now that you will just heal sick people, that you'll provide for people who need, that you will fix our families, and that you get the monkeys off our backs. You can do it, oh God. You are God. And we look to you for everything. Let it happen according to our faith tonight. Send us home now. We know the devil is upset. We learn stuff tonight. And he gets an attitude when we learn things about you. Please put an impenetrable shield around us, Lord. When we finish our reception tonight. Some people are hungry. If we can get a little something to wet our, to, 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 to wet our lips and, and give us a little sustenance to make ourselves whole as we go home. I pray, Lord, as we go home that you would protect us. Don't let the devil hurt us because we've decided tonight that we will follow you. Let it be, I pray tonight, in the name of Jesus and for his name's sake. Amen. God bless you, folk. Have a good night. I have a couple of graduates that I need to acknowledge tonight. Thank you for getting those lights on. You're going to go back to your seats, but don't leave this very second. I've got a couple of graduates that I need to call tonight, and I want you to come forward if you can and get your certificate. I need my ushers or somebody to help me. What about Jemiah McClendon? Where's Jemiah McClendon? Is Jemiah McClendon here? And we also have Angel McAfee. If you're here tonight, I have your certificate and your Bible down front. And we're going to ask all of our graduating friends, anybody who got a certificate tonight, if you will come down front. Our photographer is on duty. He's going to be here. And we're going to get your portrait done.